I almost did. <laughs> we'll give it a couple more minutes. We'll get started here, folks, in just one minute. It is straight up. Uh, ah, we're one minute into it. You know what? We're going to go ahead. They're recording this, so anybody who's not here might have the pleasure of uh, tuning in later. My talk track today is backup does not equal cyber recovery. I'm going to talk more about that later, but that's going to be a recurring theme of my conversation as we walk through the slide deck. Um, oops, not that one. A little bit of introduction. Um, my name is Rich Eicher. I'm an engineer at Rubric in our specialty engineering organization. My focus has been on our security overlay products that sit on top of our already incredibly secure um, core platform. I've been doing data security quite a while. I've been with Rubrik two years and a couple months, but I've been doing data security for a long time, about 28 years now. Um, up out of the Seattle market, I've worked for some of the folks you may suspect. I've worked for Microsoft, T-Mobile, Expedia, and the likes. I've done intrusion detection systems. I've worked on um, IDS, IPS, VPNs. Vulnerability assessment is where I've spent a bulk of my time in the last 15 years at a very large scale, quite frankly. Um, there were times where I was managing up to six million assets at one time. So um, that were scanned on a continual basis, literally, and we never stopped. So I did things at massive scale. So I've been in the trenches where a lot of you folks will be working and are working today. So I understand the trials and tribulations of what can be thrown at you as you're working to secure and work on these systems. Um, very passionate about data security. Feel free to reach out uh, if you'd like more information or have questions after the talk. I'll be around. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Happy to connect and continue the conversation offline as well. Um, once again, though, I'm going to be talking about backup not equaling cybersecurity recovery, cyber recovery. And I'm just going to let that hang for a minute. I mean, what does that even mean? Um, it's a strange statement. But I want to talk a little bit about it. Traditionally, enterprise data protection enterprise data backup has been in the realm of IT operations for the last several decades, probably 40 years. Quite frankly, nothing much has changed in that arena in the last 40 years until recently when companies are re-envisioning how enterprise data protection should and can work. One of those companies is Rubrik. Um, we're a pioneer in that. We've kind of turned the market on its ear in the last several years with some of the capabilities we're bringing to market that really start to differentiate between a traditional recovery and a cyber recovery from a cyber event. Um, recovering a virtual machine is easy. Recovering a database is easy. That's the realm of traditional enterprise data backup. Um, you, you'll get a request, I need a file, I lost a file, I lost a server. Occasionally you'll re recover a VM, maybe a database. That's not cyber recovery. That's just traditional backup and recovery. Cyber recovery is when you have a cyber event, a destructive data event, and you need to recover your systems um, accordingly. And there's a lot of information you need to be able to do that successfully. It's not just as simple as recovering a VM, we're good now. We'll talk more about it as we move through the conversation. Um, the current threat landscape, obviously, is not good, and it's not getting better. Um, on the left there, the top activities group, that's from this week, by the way. These numbers are fresh, right off the press. So as you can see, groups like Alpha, Alpha V, Black Bass, Delockbit, they're not slowing down. In fact, quite the opposite, they're speeding up. Um, top country, United States, big surprise. We have a lot of activity, a lot of uh, infrastructure to attack over here as well, and a lot of you know economic advantage to attack. Um, I put some useful links on the right-hand side there, my right. Um, these are, it's, it can be very challenging to get good open source intelligence, threat intelligence. Um, these are all Twitter feeds that if you follow, in fact, I almost suggest creating a Twitter feed just to follow some threat intelligence feeds because quite frankly, when you do, it'll start to take over your feed. I'd hate to f have you find out the first time, first indication of trouble in your organization, you don't want to find it on Twitter, but you want to monitor it to find out what's going on. You'll also get very rich and robust threat intelligence. 
these security researchers are very open and honest about their threat intel and their research. I highly suggest following them when you can because they are keeping track of new and emerging threats and trends that you see in your environment, uh, that they're seeing in your geolocation. So I can't tell you how useful it can be to follow some of those Twitter groups. Um, all right. Obviously, you know, these sectors are just getting pummeled. Look at the healthcare and the public health. 210 incidents um, I mean, across all verticals are being attacked. But as you can see, critical manufacturing, government, IT shops, healthcare, they're just getting brutally attacked just constantly. And the top threat actors, Lockbit, Alpha V, Black Hat, and Hive. I mean, these folks are not slowing down. So you really need to get as much threat intelligence as you humanly can against them. Um, right now, when, when there's a ransomware attack, and I work closely with our ransomware response team at Rubrik. I should have mentioned that, I guess. Um, Rubrik has a ransomware response team. Out of our 5,000 plus customers, our customers get attacked as well. But the difference is our customers have support for them. We have a team dedicated to them. I work with this team frequently due to my experience in threat hunting. Um, right now, what we're seeing across the board is that every one of these attacks is incorporating both encryption event and an exfiltration event. So we have to really be cognizant of the fact that they're not just locking the data. They're just not denying our access to the data. They're taking it to use as leverage. So a double extortion. Basically, they're extorting you for the encrypted data. They're extorting you with the threat of leaking your data on the public or on the dark web. And I'll even take it to a next step, tertiary extortion. They're actually then turning their attention to the folks that, they, that are in your data, your partners, your customers, your employees. They might start attacking them or calling them. We've heard reports that folks whose data lost data they're phoning the people, they're calling the people whose data they stole to extort them now. So where does this end? It's not going to end anytime soon. We have to take better preparation. Um, the state of data security is bad. I hate to say, <laughs> across the board, we can all do so much better. 98% of uh, IT shops out there have indicated that they have faced an attack. Um, so it's. I don't need to even really go over some of these statistics. You've all heard this. It's on CNN. It's on the Wall Street Journal. It's everywhere. It's coming from the board down now. So the first time in my career, people from C-level to senior leadership are coming to us. They want to know what is the status. And the reason is these statistics. They're losing revenue. They're losing money. They're losing reputation. And they can't continue to do this. It's affecting the stock price. It's affecting the shareholder value or the personal value of the company. And it's um, really something that has to be addressed. So it comes down to the simple fact that businesses are absolutely under attack. And we live in an assumed breach world. And if these bad actors get into your environment and they get your data, they really got you. But if they get in and get your data and your backups, they really have you. They have you in a bad way. In fact, this suddenly can be a lights out scenario for some businesses. Um, because if you don't have your backup data to recover from, it could easily be a lights out scenario. It could take you months to rebuild. Um, we have to worry about if our data is an easy target. In a traditional system, um, enterprise data protection system, you might have multiple systems from your disk, your SAN, your disk-based backup, your backup servers, your backup proxies. These are oftentimes all connected to your AD infrastructure, all running on Windows infrastructure. Multi-factor authentication is not widely implemented and certainly not widely enforced. Basically, this is becoming a recipe for disaster right now. We're seeing this get attacked again and again and again. In fact, there's ransomware and malware specifically designed to find and attack this type of infrastructure setup. So if you are running one of them, the due diligence is on your shoulders now to watch that thing like a hawk. If you don't have multi-factor authentication on these, um, get it. Get it fast, because they're coming for you. Um, so ultimately, the complexity level. You add in the next level of complexity, which is your cloud infrastructure. And most of our customers at Rubrik, not most, many are multi-cloud customers. They're in all three major players, AWS, GCP, and Azure. 
So the level of complexity that this cloud infrastructure is bringing to the table further complicates your security model. So if you've already got this type of scenario in your environment, you add in your cloud workloads, and then all of a sudden the level of complexity is almost out of control. You might need multiple full-time employees just to keep control over this environment. Um, and of course, this is where you get the, uh, you know, the information you need not always being available. How do you know what to recover if you're attacked in these environments, if you don't have rich visibility into your data? How do you know what sensitive data could have been involved in the, in the breach and was exfiltrated? And how do you know that you're, when you're recovering that you're not just bringing the malware or ransomware back into your environment? where it redetonates and you're right back where you started from. That's the last thing we want to happen because now, as I said, the C-suite and the board is watching and they wanna know questions like, are we good? Can we recover? How long is it gonna take? These are questions that can be extremely difficult to answer um, and they want these answers and they want them soon. So ultimately, let's talk a little bit about the anatomy of these attacks and then I'll get into some of the um, common failing points in recovery. But before I do, I do want to talk about this anatomy of a ransomware attack. Let me just have one sip. Um, as I say, Rubrik has a ransomware response team. We have helped hundreds of clients to this point recover from ransomware. I have personally been involved in 18 in the last three months, and that's just the ones I've been involved in. So we've learned a ton of really useful information when working with our customers as they recover from these cyber events. So I want to just cover the anatomy of these attacks as we see it. <clears throat> First and foremost, they get in. It just takes one mistake. Um, regardless of the amount of money you've spent on protective methodology, it just takes one mistake. It could be an uh, executive admin who clicks the wrong email and your $100 million XDR investment just went out the window. The first thing they do is they stand up command and control infrastructure. They do this to bring data in and to take data out. The data they're bringing in is the hostile malware. The data they're bringing out is your data. Um, they're specifically looking for any data to exfiltrate to bullet point number two. They really love financial information. They especially love your cyber insurance policy. If they can find that, they know exactly what they can expect to extort out of you. Um, of course, during this time, they're also trying to increase their footprint both um, vertically and horizontally. They're trying to spread out and they're trying to move their access up all during this time. I mean, a lot of activity in the first bit. And also, they're not sticking around as long as they used to either. Dwell times have come down from on average of weeks to days now. We've seen as little as a day and two now. The reason is they want to get to the payday faster. After they've done all the, brought in all the data they need, taken all the data out they want, which happens probably in the first 20 minutes, then they start looking for your backup platform because they know that if they attack that and successfully remove it from your environment, you have no chance of recovering from this event. Um, so they're looking for it. In fact, there's malware written specifically to target certain um, legacy infrastructure components that support these systems. So they're very good at compromising these backups. If they can't attack the backup blob itself, they'll try to attack the clock or the time source and then try to spoof time and tell the system that it's 2050 instead of 2023 and it'll start expiring your backups. Pretty rudimentary trick, but it does work. Um, so there's a lot of vectors out there. But then at that point, um, after they've uh, attacked your backup platform, if they can get it, they will. If they can't, they'll move on. They'll detonate the malware and they'll head for the door. It leaves our customers and folks asking a ton of questions. And these questions are critical to your ability to recover. First off, how do you know your backups are safe? You better have an air gap in a mutable file system or you're in a really tough position right now. Hopefully you're doing offsite archiving as well. Number two, how do you know the blast radius? It's really difficult to recover from an attack if you don't know which systems were affected and more specifically, what data sets on those systems have been affected. You have to have observability. If you can't have that level of visibility, it makes recovery exceptionally difficult Data exfiltration, how do you know what your exposure is? We have to assume every ransomware attack I've been involved with, every single one, they exfiltrated the data. You have to assume if they have physical access or logical access to a workload, they have 
every piece of data on it. They took it. They have tools specifically crafted to exfiltrate data. I've seen them. Even if your perimeter is locked down tight, I bet you UDP port 53 is open, and they know that too. And they'll tunnel right through it, and they'll get your data out very quickly. Um, how do you know a clean recovery point? How do you recover your workloads if you don't know what clean looks like, or what your good is? It's very difficult to recover if you don't know where good is. We don't want you to have to recover more than one time. The last thing we want you to do is to spend hours or days recovering only to find out you're right back where you started from. I hate to say how often that happens. It happens every single day to somebody somewhere. And finally, automation. How do we automate this? How do we test it? Um, without the ability to automate and test, it's a theoretical process at that point. So um, I'm now going to kind of switch uh, into, based on the cases that I have worked in the last three months or so and beyond and previous to that, I'm going to talk about the most common things that are tripping points to recovery. You'd be surprised how many folks, even folks who think that they have a good disaster recovery plan or playbook, when the disaster actually happens, they realize that maybe it's not as good as they thought. Or worse yet, they don't have access to it. Where is it? Oh, it's on the server that got encrypted. Hmm. We have a problem there. So you have to continually manage and update those playbooks. Um, you need to actually make them living documents. Um, most folks we deal with don't have a set in stone document that they can pull out and start working from. It really affects your ability to recover if you don't have a documented plan that you've tested and updated frequently. You need to perform these practical tabletop exercises to see if your plans are even remotely close to what will really work. In fact, as I move forward here, I'm going to show some other techniques that will help you in your ability to test those plans. Because up until you utilize them, that's all they are. They're just a plan. They aren't actionable. They aren't operational until you actually utilize them. So really make sure that you spend some time having a good rock solid playbook for a disaster recovery. And I, I mean, everybody, a lot of organizations have traditional disaster recoveries if the data center gets flattened, but they don't necessarily have cyber event recovery playbooks. That is a much different event. So really think about what it would take to recover your most critical systems from a cyber event. What if they weren't available for two weeks? What are you going to do? Um, and this really plays into that as well. It surprises me to this day when it comes time to recovery that even mature organizations don't always have a tiered system of criticality for their workloads. Meaning, what are my crown jewels? If they're down, we're down. The business is down. Um, you have to recover your workloads in an order that makes sense. You need to recover the most critical assets first and then work your way down the long tail. Um, for instance, um, I was involved with a municipality who didn't have this order set. The, the criticality or the order of their recovery was based on who was yelling the loudest. And a municipal government had control over the police department, the fire department, and the parks and rec. And guess who was yelling the loudest? Parks and rec. So their support personnel were doing everything in their power to get parks and rec back up. All during that time, PD couldn't dispatch and fire department couldn't dispatch. They were having to route the other county in. So that's just one example of know your criticality priorities. Put your assets in a logical order of criticality so that you can recover them in that order. You don't want to open up reservations for picnic tables before you enable the PD to dispatch calls. That's just one example. Um, so really spend some time doing that. That alone can really make recovery a lot more um, achievable. You really need to stay up on overall best practices in both your infrastructure and firmware, everything across the board. Do not ignore patches. Don't think that you can install them next quarter or next month. Test them, kick the tires, apply all patches, all firmware. The top three threat vectors or attack vectors for ransomware attacks are phishing, um, known vulnerabilities in RDP. So it's about 
equally mixed through those three um, attack vectors. So not patching your edge servers, it's a disaster right now. You have to have a robust and ongoing vulnerability management system so that you're staying ahead of these problems. A systems that can't be patched, get them behind other security mechanisms. Put layers of controls in front of them because it's just a ticking time bomb. They're coming for them. They probably know they're vulnerable before you do. So pretty straightforward. That's been around for decades. We've been telling people this for decades. Keep up on your patch management. Um, here's one, in my opinion, which is the number one problem with ransomware recoveries is the human element. Don't overlook the human element. You have to make sure that you've got access control in a way that's logical for your environment. Um, one example is I, when I worked at Microsoft, anybody who ever did administrative functions on a system anywhere in the environment, you could not do it from your standard workstation. They had what was referred to as a SAW, a Secure Administrator Workstation. Everybody hated them. You had to carry Loot 2 laptops around all the time. But it was the only way you could do administrative functionality on a Microsoft asset. That's what I'm referring to, the human element. How many orgs have, everybody is an admin equiv. I mean, that's got to go away. That's the human element I'm referring to here. Making sure that your users only have visibility and access to the critical infrastructure they need to have access to. We need to follow the least privileged access model having flat networks with the everyone group uh, having access to everything on your environment, that's just a recipe for disaster. That's what these threat actors are taking advantage of. That's why they're so successful. So in my opinion, the number one thing that comes up in a recovery effort is that the human element has gotten so far out of control that we can recover, but you're probably gonna get it attacked again unless you apply some really good hygiene to your practices internally. So definitely do not overlook the human element. Here's a big one too. This one causes a delay almost every single time in every ransomware recovery that I've personally worked with. Having alternative comms. People don't even know how to get a hold of their boss or their senior leader during these attacks. They, they don't have corporate phones, they don't, the corporate email's down, they didn't take the time to establish out-of-band communication mechanisms. Very critical, set it up in advance. Uh, make sure that everybody who's going to be necessary for a cyber recovery has access to the out-of-band communication protocols. It, I hate to say it might end up being Gmail for your communication. I don't care what it is, you just establish it in advance. Don't try to figure it out on day two of the attack. That's the worst time to try to establish your out-of-band communication policy. So make sure it works, train people to know it works, try it sometime. One day, just say, hey, we're cutting over to alternate comms, and then just shut it off. Don't reply to anything except for on alternative comms. There's ways to force it. Um, another biggie, establishing a relationship with an outside security vendor. Um, many ransomware recovery operations are delayed, if not slowed down significantly, because the customer says, this is beyond the scope of our capability to deal with. We're going to call an outside security vendor. I have news for you. You can't call them on Friday at 5 p.m. and expect them to be there at 7. That's not how it works. You need to have a pre-existing relationship, sometimes even a, um, some sort of fee, a deposit down to get them a retainer so that they're interested in working with you. The more familiar they are with your environment, the better it's going to go. So spending a little time to become familiar with the third party security vendor is in your best interest because it will only expedite. If the third party security vendor understands what systems are most critical, they already probably have some strategy to help you recover. So I can't tell you how important it is to have a good relationship. That also includes relationships with local law enforcement potentially as well. Um, make sure that if it applies to you, especially if you're in a regulated industry or in a government industry, there's organizations such as InfraGuard where you can snap into their community and you can become part of the community to share intelligence and information with them. That's why those organizations ex exist. So having that relationship in advance is definitely a good idea. Um, I talked about this a little, but determining what data is important to you, it may not be um, because of regulatory and compliance issues. Oftentimes it is. 
that's also something that folks worry about. There's a lot of mandates that have breach notification um, requirements, meaning that the fines kick in if you don't notify your users by X days. You need to know that in advance. If you are, if that's one of those rules that are applicable to you, don't wait until you miss the deadline to find out. Do the research in advance and find out what your breach notification requirements are. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can get a better understanding of your sensitive data inside your environment. Obviously, take control over it in advance because that's what these bad actors are coming for. They're coming for the data. The data is the objective of these guys. They hold it data, they hold it ransom or hold it hostage, they encrypt it, they deny you access to it. Because right now, business is data in most businesses that we work with. Um, exporting your logs, another key thing that most folks do, aren't doing um, effectively, especially with your most critical assets. Export those logs, have syslog export so you can go back and find out what happened later. You may not think it's valuable. Obviously, it becomes real valuable after the attack. If you haven't set it up in advance, you don't have it. Um, dump it out to Splunk, to Logarithm, QRadar, whatever the case may be. Make sure your systems can handle webhook um, capabilities as well. Also consider security orchestration automation response tools. If you're running on a shoestring budget with lack of staff, consider orchestration automation. Um, every security incident is, when analyzed by a human analyst, the same 10 steps are followed every single time, very likely. Why not automate that? Why not orchestrate that? Speed it up, enrich your incidents. You don't have to have it take action, but start to collect data till you get a comfort level with the action. Every single time, I would have just gone to the next phase, so now I'm gonna let my orchestration model do it. So consider that as well. Um, Here's something that is a newish concept, and it's getting more and more attention in the uh, ransomware space, in the ransomware recovery space. Consider isolated infrastructure. And where this comes into play is that with, uh, with next generation firewalls, this is becoming easier and easier. For instance, at Rubrik, we have capability to be able to orchestrate applications for DR or isolated recovery capability. Having the ability to fail your application over to a completely isolated recovery zone gives you the ability to recover your production while still preserving the evidence if you're asked to preserve that evidence for an investigation or even if your security team wants to run forensics on it. So we do this all the time. Um, you push the images that you are infected to isolation so they can't spread into your environment. It enables you to recover your production environment. Seriously consider it and then also bring those isolation zone based recovery plans into your existing playbooks because they can really benefit you. In fact, you might find that you need to rewrite your playbooks because of your newfound capability to isolate hosts. Um, and when I say isolate, my personal um, hypervised infrastructure has three networks that I can move assets to. I've got my production, I've got development, and I've got isolation. Production, as you would think, full-blown production network. My development network, though, no lateral movement. It can't get to prod, it can, but my DevOps team and security team can get there. My ISO zone, separate infrastructure, it's a black hole. If I push a device there, it's not getting anywhere. So I use that network all the time for um, threat intelligence gathering. So consider isolated environments in your environment. It gives you a lot of options for recovery. Okay, I'm, I'm not gonna go through all this because this is some protecting, I will share this deck out. There's some really common te protecting uh, techniques for protection methodology against the most common vectors. Since they cut me down to 25 minutes from 55 minutes, I'm gonna just skip over this, but this will be in the deck that gets sent out. Basically just talking about the most common techniques, putting a little bit of statistics around it giving you a few ideas about common protection methodologies for these most common attack vectors. RDP, don't even call it remote desktop protocol. Start calling it ransomware deployment protocol because ultimately that's what it is. Um, if you've got RDP on your perimeter, they know about it. Um, everybody stood up RDP at the beginning of COVID because they didn't know how they're gonna admin their servers. Guess what, they're still there, they didn't go away. Scan for them, look for them. Um, also, steps to secure RDP, obviously pretty straightforward, but uh, 
vulnerable public facing endpoints. This is right up there with phishing. Um, people have devices sitting on their edge that have common vulnerabilities that haven't been patched. Once again, I talked about your patching cadence. Don't let them sit on the edge unpatched. It's just a sitting duck. It's going to eventually get compromised. Um, make sure that your enterprise data protection solution has air gap and immutability at a minimum, at a bare minimum. If you don't have immutability and air gap, basically your backup arrays are browsable, mountable, and tamperable and editable. Don't let bad actors edit your backup infrastructure. Um, make sure there's protections against premature expiration too, because it happens all the time. Um, make sure you have a bunker in a box. Make sure you have end-to-end -end encryption everywhere, MFA everywhere. If you can do one thing when you leave here, ask your admins. Do we have multi-factor authentication on every device, on every asset inside of our organization? If the answer is not yes, make it be yes. Find a way to implement MFA everywhere. That eliminates 99.9% .9 of all attack vectors right there. You're going to really be in a much better position simply by enforcing MFA across the board. Um, we're moving in the next frontier in data security, so you really have to have some of this functionality. Without a system that is monitoring your backups for anomalies, they will happen to your backup infrastructure. It's really useful if your backup infrastructure can report to you and tell you that it has experienced an anomaly. Otherwise, you're going to have to find it yourself. Perhaps even having a, a methodology to do threat hunting within your backup archive would be useful. Rubrik has that in our platform. If you're interested, feel free to come chat with us about it. But, um, it all comes down to zero trust architecture methodology. So I've kind of come to the top of the hour. I'm technically supposed to stop. I don't hear anybody yelling at me, so I'm not going to until they do, I guess. But ultimately, I put in a ton of really useful. <laughs> all right, I said it and he did. I put a ton of really useful links here at the very end of this, the last page. I, I highly suggest spending a little time. If, if ransomware and ransomware recovery is your concern, these links are extremely useful. So much free open source threat intelligence out there. Take advantage of it. Sign up for CISO alerts. They may, you may think it's annoying getting all those emails, but someday you're gonna get one and go, oh my God, that's for us. That's the nugget I've been waiting for. This is the one alert that's gonna save my butt tomorrow. So thanks a lot, everybody. If you want, have any follow-up questions, I'll be around. Otherwise, thanks for having us.